Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. Welcome to my review of Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. This is a movie, my most anticipated movie of the year. My most anticipated movie of 2024. It's right above Planet of the Apes, Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. That is my second most anticipated movie of the year. So I'm a massive Ghostbusters fan. Uh, I'll get into that in a little bit. But if you guys haven't seen the movie yet, I am going to hit on some minor spoilers for Frozen Empire. I'm not going to give away the ending or anything like that. But in order to kind of deep dive into my overall thoughts of the movie, I'm going to have to spoil some things. So if you haven't seen the movie and you really want to see it, then I definitely recommend you guys go see it first. But if you're okay with minor spoilers, then just stick around and we're going to get into Frozen Empire. So I'm a massive Ghostbusters fan. I, I Every time I talk about Ghostbusters, I always talk about how I had like all the gear, all the toys and in like kindergarten, one of my earliest memories is bringing my trap, my proton pack and everything to show and tell massive Ghostbusters fan for almost 40 years. So I've been a fan of the franchise from the beginning and I was looking forward to this movie. Now, I, I didn't expect this movie was going to be as good as Afterlife. I mean, Afterlife was a love letter to the fans. Most like Rocky Bo ba Rocky Bo ba Rocky Balboa. Ooh, it took a while to get that out. Rocky Balboa was like a love letter to the Rocky fans. If it wasn't for Rocky Balboa, we wouldn't have gotten the Creed movies. That Rocky Balboa was going through basically Rocky's life and everything that was going through, and it was a real love letter to those fans. Afterlife was a love letter and an apology letter for the 2016 Ghostbusters movie. Some people might like that movie. I think it's an abomination. So I didn't think Frozen Empire was going to even be on the level of Afterlife, especially since Jason Reitman directed Afterlife, you know, the son of Ivan Reitman, who's no longer with us, the guy who helped write and direct the original Ghostbuster films. Jason Reitman did Afterlife. He didn't do this one. So I wasn't expecting the same type of quality from, from this movie going in. But here's my overall thoughts of the movie. I left the theater as a hardcore Ghostbusters fan happy. Was I thrilled? Was I like on cloud nine like I was with Afterlife? No, I wasn't. Afterlife was like a, a phenomenal movie. A phenom like it had the laughs, it had the fears, it had the, the, the tears, it had everything. Frozen Empire didn't have that. It had the laughs. I was entertained. I walked away with a smile. I didn't walk away like I felt like I wasted my money. That was the most important thing. I didn't feel like I wasted my money with Frozen Empire. But Frozen Empire does have a lot of problems problems in the movie and a lot of the problems come in the form of just incoherent storytelling and what i mean by that is there's like a million characters in this movie each one of these characters kind of has their own little subplot going and the movie just kind of doesn't feel like it, it, it knows which direction it wants to go right you have the original cast uh, from the original Ghostbusters movie. I'm talking about Dan Aykroyd, Bill Murray, Ernie Hudson. You have that cast. And not only that, but they're also trying to shoehorn in the new characters. The problem with shoehorning the new characters in is it doesn't really make sense to the plot. So they do some things to try to make it make sense to the plot. And what, about, what I mean by that is you have... Phoebe, you have the dude from Stranger Things, you got the mother and Paul Rudd, they're the new Ghostbusters, they're taking over the firehouse, and they they are the new Ghostbusters, essentially, okay, makes sense, they're a family, they, they move to New York, they take over the firehouse, and they're the new Ghostbusters, Phoebe, you know, we, we love Phoebe, especially the relationship with her and Paul Rudd, I thought that was all phenomenal, the, the problem is, the other characters from what was it, Oklahoma and Afterlife, they're also conveniently in New York, which doesn't make no sense. It's like, oh, pod, the podcast kid is just conveniently working with Ray Stanth, Dan Aykroyd's character, in his library with a show he's on. Oh, and the other girl, the, the black girl, is just conveniently interning with, with Winston in this new secret lab that they're building. So these characters just secretly are here, like, com very conveniently, and it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense i felt like it would have made more sense you know if they would went ahead and why was the mom a ghostbuster i don't understand like there was nothing in that first movie that made it seem like she even wanted to put on a proton pack whereas you look phoebe and her brother and even paul rudd they they, they, they were doing it you know paul rudd was a fan of the, of the original ghostbusters it made sense it would make more sense if the mom was just like hey i don't know if you should be bringing these kids out on this ride and then you could have either took the podcast kid or the black chick i'm sorry i don't or i think her name is luck 
Lucky. I, I'm just going to call her Lucky and, and make her a Ghostbuster. It would have been better if Lucky, Phoebe, the brother, and Paul Rudd were all the Ghostbusters team. And then you have that dilemma to where why is Paul Rudd bringing these miners out on these missions? And then you have Walter Peck from the original movie who was the inspector that blew off the roof of the containment center and everything from the first movie. He's the mayor this time, and he really comes down on a family because Phoebe's underage. So it would just make more sense like, okay, let's get the whole Ghostbuster. To, it would be like the extreme Ghostbusters cartoon where you have these underage kids that are Ghostbusters. Technically, the brother, Wolf, Wolf Tart, or whatever that kid's name is from Stranger Things, it would make more sense. You know, well, he's, he's 18, so technically he's not a minor, but the other kids would be minors, and then you would have the mayor, like, you have a, a group of minors with nuclear accelerators on their backs, you know, going through and doing all this stuff. So it would make more sense. There were just a lot of subplots and stuff that was convenient and didn't make a whole lot of sense. Like there was a moment where Phoebe's doing like this Casper the Friendly Ghost thing with this side story. It, it kind of pays off toward the end of the movie. And then, like I said, you have Lucky doing her thing, the podcast kid doing his thing. You have the original Ghostbusters all doing their own thing. Winston has like this aquarium that's now like this secret underground facility to make a bigger containment unit and study the paranormal. It just it doesn't make a whole lot of sense when you think about it, right? Why isn't why isn't Ray Stance working with Winston? It doesn't make any sense. Like you would think, oh, we're gonna we're gonna hire these new characters, and not only do we have the characters from the last movie, but then we have even more new characters, new characters that work with Winston inside the lab, like the white guy with the glasses with the blonde hair, and then the, uh, the other chick. So you you have so many different characters, and toward the end of the movie, all these characters have their own proton pack, and then the original characters have their proton pack, and it's just it's it's like a massive cluster f of different characters in the in the movie and that's sort of where the movie falls apart was i'm hitting my microphone is that there was no focus there was no like focus on the movie where you see like afterlife there was a, a, a sure focus on it like we're gonna follow the descendants of egon spangler and we're gonna follow like the these characters and and she's gonna discover her origin or not origin but like basically the you know her her grandfather and what he did and how important he was and the mystery about why he came to this dirt farm and all this different thing there was a, a focus on the movie where this one we're focusing on we're focusing on the the old characters the new characters the new 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 characters and then we're, we're also trying to figure out the this whole plot of this 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 sphere and why this fear is so important and this frozen demon and all this stuff. And that doesn't even get to the worst part of the movie, which was the one guy who played in Eternals. Uh, I don't know this dude's name. Maybe I should have looked it up. Even if I looked up his name, I would not be able to pronounce his name anyway. But he's in Eternals. He's in a lot of different things. This dude belongs in a completely different movie, guys. This guy was over the top. He plays like this fire lord or something, whatnot. I don't, I don't even know, man. Like he's he's like this this keeper of the sphere. His family kept this sphere for generations, and his grandmother passed, and he goes and pawns it to to Dan Aykroyd's character, and it eventually gets opened and that causes the frozen empire storyline to kind of progress. But this character felt like he was in a completely different movie. He was over the top. One thing I loved about ghostbusters and the original eighties films was their comedy was played very, very flat. It was very flat. It was funny comedy. It was hilarious. Some of the things that Egon and Ray and, and all of them said it was hilarious, but it was played very, very flat. It wasn't like over the top. It was, wasn't was slapstick, and it was hilarious. And what I really liked about Afterlife was you had characters like Phoebe and Podcast that really gave that flat tone, that humor that we expect from the Ghostbusters franchise, and it worked. And I felt like they this, this cat, he was just like all over the place, like, oh, man, it's a sex dungeon, and oh, my God, and blah, 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 blah. And it, it was just really kind of just all over the place. When, when when that character showed up and he completely took me out of the movie like he really really took me out of the movie and he he felt like he belonged in a completely completely different movie so there were so many different characters that they introduced into this movie and it felt very unfocused 
you, you're, you're trying to throw, and I know a lot of people are talking about, well, what about all the little references and stuff to the original Ghostbusters? The references weren't as bad as people make them out to be. Yes, you had Walter Peck come back, and he's the mayor. You had the little Stay Puft Marshmallow men running around. You had Slimer making an appearance, and you had the li librarian ghost from the original movies. But at least it made sense why they were there. It was like, oh, Slimer would be in the Ghostbusters house. If you watch the real Ghostbusters cartoon, you know why Slimer is there. Oh, you the library and ghosts would still be haunting the library than when they go to the library. Stay Puft Marshmallow Man, you could take them out if you want to. I, I understand merchandising and stuff, but Stay Puft has always played a role in the Ghostbusters franchise. Even in Ghostbusters 2, there were still Stay Puft logos around because that's the brand of marshmallows are in that time. The real problem with this movie is just the unfocusedness and the different characters that you have, and they're all just kind of like doing their own thing. Like I said, Phoebe's got like this Casper the Friendly Ghost thing going on, and then you have all these other characters just kind of, kind of doing this own like like Lucky's working with Winston, and Podcast is working with Ray, and then you have like Winston has this whole other corporation, and it doesn't make a lot of sense. You would think Winston would do that with with Ray, with Dan Aykroyd's character. And, and it just conveniently, everyone from Oklahoma just happens to be in New York City. It just it conveniently. And I felt like they could have really knocked out a few of those characters, for real. If not knocked out those characters, at least get rid of some of the characters. If you wanted to bring back all the Oklahoma kids and say, hey, it's summer vacation. They're in town to visit for the summer. That's perfectly fine. I'm down with that. But get rid of the, the white kid, the white guy scientist that works with um, his name is Lars. He works with Winston. Get rid of him. Get rid of the female assistant. Get rid of uh, the over-the-top um, guy who sounds like a cartoon character who's a fire master. Get rid of him. Get rid of the, the female ghost character. You could eliminate five to six characters in this movie, shorten the story to make more sense, and then have one straightforward plot. That's the biggest problem. Is the plot was all over the place. Sort of like my review. My review is all over this place. Like I'm just kind of like going everywhere. Um, it's sitting at 43% on Rotten Tomatoes. So that's something, but, um, yeah, it's it just, it, it's, it's not a fantastic movie by any means. By the way, if you guys are wondering who I'm talking about, it's, it's this cat right here. Um, he played in a lot of different things. He played in the big sick. He played in internals. He, he played in a lot of different things, but he's over the top and it's absolutely awful. It's like, he's in a completely different movie should be in a completely different movie. Unfortunately, by the end of the movie, the movie kind of picks up steam where it's kind of focused on one plot where the ghostbusters are doing ghostbuster stuff. And I liked it the way I recommend this movie to people. If you are not a hardcore ghostbusters fan, and you're sort of on the fence, don't go see it. I'm a hardcore Ghostbusters fan. Like, I'm, I'm going to go see it. I'm going to find enjoyment out of it. I'm going to be able to leave the theater happy that I spent the money, regardless of, of the problems that the movie had, because I am a massive fan of Ghostbusters. It feels like a really good episode of the cartoon. There was a lot of different stories going on in the real Ghostbusters cartoon, and this feels like, oh, this could have been just a really good two-part episode of the real Ghostbusters cartoon from the 80s and 90s, and that's pretty much the way I look at it, and I really enjoyed the movie for what it was does it have problems absolutely but at the end of the day at least it wasn't the 2016 ghostbuster so i look at it like if you are a fan then yes go see it if you are not a fan and you're on the fence wait just wait wait for vod or just skip it all together because this movie is not going to be for everybody i don't think it's a very well put together movie i give it a passing like six out of ten but yeah, I, I thought it was good. It ranks it ranks dead last in my Ghostbusters list. Like, I, I think it's like Ghostbusters number one, Afterlife, Ghostbusters two, and then then Frozen Empire is definitely last on the totem pole. But there's things to really enjoy about it if you can overlook some of the some of the sloppiness in the movie overall but anyway that's just my thoughts on it guys have you guys seen frozen empire are you looking forward to seeing frozen empire have you already seen frozen empire leave those comments in the comment box below smash that like and subscribe button until next time as always i am robert storms and thank you so much for watching